Anyone know the answers? Very good. Anyone else? So this is a Jupyter Notebook. Um, I actually coded it up to actually plot the curve. Um, it's actually in Julia, not Python. I don't know how to do the following in Python. Um, so here we have two sliders. Um, I'm going to show you the P, how much is parallelizable, right? Um, and so the first question was, um, we want a speed up of five with 10 processors, right? Well, there's, let me, Now we can see five processors um, or 10 processors and we're speed of five. Um, um, you can catch up. So I'm getting 0.885, which is close, right? Um, next one was with 20 processors, right? And what speed up did we want? With 20 processors, speed up of Of ten, um, not good enough, right? So we get a speed up of a factor of ten with twenty processors, right? P needs to be 0 0.948, which means almost 95% of your program needs to be perfectly <coughs> parallelizable, right? And I think the last one was getting a speed of 25 for 50. Um, so we're close, right? Then it's point nine. You know, the problem with Armadale's law is that it doesn't take into account communication costs between processors, which is significant, right? Because communication is never really slower than processors. So I did a second one. Um, where C is the fraction of 
the time one processor does it needs to be for the communication costs, right? So this is basically if point zero zero one times the T one time for process one processor to do it, um, and P is point ninety eight, and oh look what happens, right? The curve goes up and then it goes down. Right, and if we actually increase it a lot, right, it starts going down further. So there's two important lessons. Number one, adding more processors doesn't mean you're going to get the job done any faster, right? It can actually slow you down. The second lesson is visualization, right, can be very useful. Right, one person was able to compute for one point, right? What we were able to do probably took you more time than we just did to actually be able to see the results um, for all the questions. So visualizing data um, is a powerful way of just to help one, just understand what's going on in the data, what you've got in the data. Um, so we will be spending some time talking about different types of plots we can do and make doing them. Um, <laughs> you have to be careful. Um, the reason I chose Julia for this is because uh, I know how to make these sliders to make the thing change in real time. I don't know how to do that in Python. But there's 60 of you, so someone should be able to figure it out and tell me. The next time I can do it in Python. Okay, any questions? And the magic part is the yeah, manipulate puts the uh, sliders on there and does the interaction part. Um, So I want to use mach you know, multiple machines, right, to improve the throughput of solving, you know, analyzing lots of data. Um, I mean, you have to ask the question, you know, what, what types of problems can we solve doing that, right? What are the problems with the communication, how many machines you need? Um, and then, how do we get the data to all the machines, right? If you've got terabytes of data, it's going to take some time to, pro you know, ship the right data. How to get the right data to the right machine? Um, you know, what happens when one machine fails? And indeed, the question is, what does it mean for a machine to fail? What happens if the machine is slow to respond? Does that mean the machine's failed or is it slow? And at what point? Do you decide, okay, that machine is no longer going to respond, right? 
and how how you make how do you distribute that load? How do you make sure it's balanced so the machine is doing a lot of the work and the machine is sitting idle? Um, how do you share the computation? You know, what machine does what part? And how do you bring the answers all back, right? Combine them and then performance tuning, you know, tweaking all these things to make sure that you're as efficient as possible. I mean, these are hard questions to solve, right? If you sat down by yourself from scratch, um, they're hard. Now, what Spark does is it it solves most of these problems for you, but it does so at a cost of only solving for certain types of problems. Um, so we usually call these embarrassing parallel until someone realized that it's not embarrassing when you've got simple problems to solve, so to solve them. So now it's called pleasingly parallel. Um, if I want to compute the sum of a you know, long string of numbers, it's pretty easy to parallelize it, right? You just we divide it into two separate, and now we can compute the sum, right? And then we can bring the gap back together, right? So Spark is good at these pleasingly parallel where it's easy to separate into pieces, solid pieces, and then combine back, resolve back together again. Um, weather simulation, not so much. Um, so what do you, when you're trying to simulate the weather, what do you do? You divide the region into small little grids, and you have to do the grids in three dimensions because upper atmosphere and lower atmosphere behave differently. And then you get this basically these cubes, right? And then you have to then figure out the dynamics in the cube. And then you have to figure out the interaction between all the cubes, right? And you time step it through over and over and over again. And so if we want to use multiple machines to do that, what do we have to do? Um, on well, processor one, we can give it you know certain cubes. In this case, we'll just look at two dimensions, and then you can go through one at a time and update each of these cells based upon you know complicated equations um, and inputs with you know solar gain and rain and blah blah blah, blah blah blah, and then you know figure out wind velocities, and then you can figure out the interaction between. And so now we got to right, but once we want to do a you know, larger area or longer time span when you use multiple machines. What do we do? We get a second processor to the same thing, but now there's a boundary here, right? And so every time step, we go here, we go here, but we also need this, these information to interact. So we need to push, push that data back and forth each time step, right? People who do these types of simulations, these types of programs, they look at Spark and they're like, what? I mean, are you crazy? Um, it's not useful at all, right? There's all that communication, right? It's just gonna be, and it's gonna be hard to fit this type of problem into the Spark model, and it's not gonna be very efficient because it's, Every time step you have to, what you really want to do in Spark problem is you want to be able to take a, each machine, a chunk of data, it does a bunch of stuff on all that data, and then we combine the result. And so people who do those types of problems, right? I mean, it, you have to figure out, are we on a cluster? Um, what sort of communication are we on a cluster? Are we on a parallel machine? If we're on a parallel machine, what architecture do we have? How can we communicate? And then try and schedule uh, pieces of jobs so that the communication works, right? Um, Spark is like, no, no. You're just going to hand me a truckload of data, and I will chop it into pieces for you, 
Now you'll just set it out and get, bring it back. So I'm going to do the same thing on each one of those blocks. Um, now, you know, we're sort of used to writing code with, you know, four, four loops, right? I mean, doesn't everyone do the four I equals this semicolon, blah, blah, blah. Um, you can't parallelize that. Right, we, we can't have the compiler parallelize it very well. We can't write programs to go and inspect that, that loop and figure it out because the problem is the loop is looping over all the data and it's, we have no idea, you have to analyze what you're doing in that block to figure out what the dependencies are, right? I do something like this, right? All of a sudden I'm, jumping from different parts of data, and now to figure out what data you need in each processor, it gets complicated, um, and that's just two lines of code. Now, now assume you're doing a weather simulation or you have got thousands of lines of code, um, doesn't work. Now, if we, use these functional constructs like reduce. Um, there is a loop there, right? But we're not writing a loop. We're just telling, we're just saying, add all the values in that, in that array or table, or whatever it is, right? Now we can swap that reduce that runs on a single machine with a reduce that will split the data in pieces, send it to different machines, run reduce individually, and then finally bring it back. So when we start doing things on Spark, we don't want these for loops, just forget it. Yeah, so reduce and map, all those things are common in functional programming, right? Well, um, how many machines do you have? So you've got two machines. Well, then the reduce can take your data and cut it in half, right? and send each half a different machine, or keep one on a local machine and one remote machine, and then r run reduce on the data on each machine, right? And then we can pull it back. And um. Well, that's an implementation issue, right? You know, what's the best way of doing that? Um, you probably don't, probably not going to do it recursively because you didn't know in advance how many processes you have. And so then it's just n, right? Divided into n pieces. Spark has a hard time providing work for four. Yeah, this is this is not just Spark, right? Taking code like this and paralyzing it, that is you know, ten PhD theses. I could assign you that problem. It might be hard, but you could do it, right? So we're going, you know, from a research program that's going to take, you know, a decade or two, many, many PhDs to do, and they'll only have partial results to something I can assign to master students. Because you have to analyze what's going on in here, and it could be anything. 
And, oh, it's, you've restricted what you can do here, right? I can't start accessing random you know, elements in the collection. It's like, no, I'm just going to give you the operation I want you to do on those elements. And then the reduce function is going to pull the elements for you, right? You have no idea, does reduce go from the back end and go forward or the front end and go, right? And it doesn't tell you, you don't, you don't care to know. It's like, okay, just apply plus to all these elements. And since it doesn't matter which order we do plus in, well, it does matter, right? If you've got really large numbers and really small numbers, it can matter. Um, but in general, the numbers aren't out of place. It doesn't matter which order you do them in. So in general with Spark, right, you like here's, you know, a big, huge table. We want to take, you know, find the average of this column, right? Find the sum of this column. And so Spark can, you know, divide, divide the data in pieces for you, apply it into pieces, and then get the, bring the most partial results back and combine them. Right. And in Python, right, there's a library called Dask, which hopefully goes a little later in the semester. We'll do this for you in Python. So if you have you know a multi-core machine, you can tell, you know, here's my data set divided into K pieces and I'll spit it out into each core doing other piece. And if you've got multiple machines, you can spit across that too. You don't need Spark, you just and you can do it at a high level, like, okay, take this data frame and give me four processors and now apply this operation to it using those four processors. So yeah, parallel and Python code, yeah, there's various ways of doing it. Um, so in the big data world, Hadoop came first, um, and then Spark came a few years later, but there were some big changes that was occurring at the time. So when, when Hadoop started, memory was really expensive. Um, so Hadoop was designed in a time frame when Memory is expensive, and so you couldn't use much memory, and so you always wrote things off the disk. Spark was started a few years later, and by that time, the prices of memory started going down significantly, I mean, quite rapidly. And they said, okay, now we can afford, now the goal is don't write any other disk. The goal is keep things in memory as much as possible. And the other trend was that functional programming is starting to catch on. So Hadoop, um, does use MapReduce like Spark does. But the difference is Hadoop is like, oh, how do you do MapReduce? Oh, you subclass this class and, and you override the map function and you then subclass this other class and override the right map function. And Spark was like, what? I mean, just add a map method to your data frames, right? And then you're done. Um, and once you do that, Spark becomes easier to use. You're not creating subclasses. And it's like, no, it's just here's a little function. You apply it and map. And once you realize that, oh, we can not restrict to just map or do it. There's a bunch of other functions we can use too, right? Um, so Spark is easier to use. It has more functionality. And it's significantly faster than Hadoop. Primarily because it's, it's trying to keep everything in memory. 
whereas Hadoop is writing to disk, right? And so Spark claims to be anywhere from 10 times to 100 times faster than Hadoop. So we're not going to talk about Hadoop. It's just, um, and just to make the point, right? So Google Trends, right, whatever it means, you know, the blue is Apache Hadoop in about 2015, it reaches peak and it's slowly been going down. And then Spark, you know, who knows what this is all about, but it, you know, eventually it catches up and <clears throat> now it's interesting when you look at things at a at a finer granularity, we get this, right? So what's going on? Google, this is based on Google searches, yeah. You know, Google Trends, you go to Google Trends and you type in this phrase and that phrase and it gives you these nice little, any possible explanations for that? Yeah, it's just people are working and they're Googling things and then when they go home, they Google different things. They don't Google work things, right? Or most people don't. But again, the power of visualization, right? It gives you, you know, what's going on here, right? And of course, we, you know, to Confirm, we can start looking at the dates and figure out what dates they are, but. These numbers are old. Um, Things have changed significantly, but the order of magnitude are probably still pretty accurate. Um, the L1 cache reference is, you know, really, really fast. Um, the L2 cache reference is, well, it's it's still fast, but it's a lot slower than an L1 cache, right? Um, doing a an lock and unlock, well, that's getting, relatively expensive, right? Referencing main memory, that's like forever um, compared to, right? I mean, it's... What? 200 times slower? Um, you know, compressing data, I mean, it's getting really... Um, Doing a read, a random read on SS, SS drive. So now you can see why Spark is a lot faster, right? Even accessing main memory, 100 nanoseconds times. So every time you have to go to the disk, right? That's that's going to really be painful. Um, Oh, sending data to, and then getting a response back, much, much slower, right? Um, and then, oh, hard drives, bad news, right? So reading from a disk is like 20 times slower than, and these are old SSD drives, and they're much, much faster now. Which is why all the data centers now, I mean, forget it. You know. Do you really want to use hard drives? Only if you don't need quick access, right? Um, What's branch um, Branch misprodict? Okay, so the way machines work these days is you've got a pipeline, right? 
Um, and so you're, you, you're, you're, this pipeline is doing different instructions, you know, different times, right? Different parts of instructions, instruction the data, right? But the problem is when you come to an if statement, it's like, oh, now you get a problem because if you got this pipeline, it's like the H to H pipeline, and at the very end, you're actually doing the computation. Um, now when we come to graph if statement, ooh, if it's true, then you do this. If it's false, you do that one. And so what do you do? Do you then have to reload your whole pipeline to answer that question, right? To do that computation? Oh, that's gonna really slow it down. So what you do is you're like, okay, we think it's gonna be true. And then we're going to, you know, fill that pipeline in advance, and then we're gonna do the computation. Oh, it was false. But now we have to reload that the pipeline, get that data for that false section, right? So yeah, it's painful. I mean, it's mispredicting is it slows you down. Now, at one point, I was told, yeah, I mean, that's that's one of the most important things about processors is if you get the predictions right, it's fast. But if you can't get the predictions right, it doesn't matter how fast your pipeline is because you have to flush it all out and refill it, and that's going to take time. And so, yeah, the, these numbers are so small, hard to, you know, so people are like, okay, just multiply by a billion, and then they, you know, one cache reference is going to be like 0.5 seconds, which is like one heartbeat, right? Um, the branch predict is like five seconds. Let's say a yawn, L2 is like a long, mutex is like making coffee, right? So you've gone from, you know, a heartbeat to standing around making coffee. And that's just, you know, in Java and Python, they both have these crazy mutex locks, right? So whenever in Java you get something synchronized, you have to get the global lock. A global lock, not a local lock. That means we're making coffee. And Python 2, right, has that global lock. So every time you, if you're using threads and you want to access memory, it's like, oh no, we had to get the lock first. And now, now we're making coffee again. Um, the main memory reference is like 100 seconds, and that's it's over a minute. You know, sending 2K bytes, I mean, 2K bytes is like nothing, right? Over one gigabit per second network, that's like five hours, right? And that's why you really have to be careful what communication costs, right? Because that, I mean, difference between half a second and five hours, Oh man, right, like round trip to the same data center is gonna take eight almost six days. Oh having hard drive, you know, doing a seek to get get the you know get the, the draw the head over the right position and getting the, the pattern the right that's like sixteen weeks. Now you want to read a, a megabyte of data from there? That's like, that's like a year. And it only takes 4.8 years to send data remote and get it back, right? So it's, you have to understand these, right? To, to know that, oh, what's happening? Um, Yeah, and that, there's a reference for this. Um, 
And now we get this this crazy plot. So someone um, measured the, the nanoseconds per element um, looking at accessing elements for link list, looking, accessing all of them, right? So you get a, a link list of 10 KB, and then you access all the elements in the link list. How long does it take an average out per element, right? And it's like, uh, and then, oh, what's going on there? Oh, now, oh, right? We, we, it, And so why? You expect it to be like a a line, right? <coughs> and you had more elements, so it should take you, you know, getting that last one takes you longer, right? So the longer it gets, it should, it should be this nice central slope. But it's not a nice central slope, is it? And where is the paging taking place? Yeah, that's the big O of one, right? So what happens here? Um, pages are, where do, when you fetch a new page, where does the page come from? Disk. How fast is accessing data from a disk? We just decided rel relative to, you know, L1 cache, it takes a year, right? There. This is L1 cache is now full. It's too big. Oh, now we're dealing L2 cache, right? Now we're dealing with L3 cache. And now main memory. Now, right? So accessing memory is not O of one, right? Even though it's random access, it depends upon where it is in the pipeline. And this is, you have to keep this in mind. Um, you know, Omdale's law says that you've got N machines, the best you can hope for is a speed of N, right? And every so often you'll come across someone who said, oh, I just broke Elmdo's law. I got a speed up of not n, but you know, two n. And it's like, no, you didn't. And typically what's happening is what they do is you take the same piece of data and you break into smaller pieces, right? And all of a sudden you instead of being out here, you're now in here on all the machines, right? And so each machines are much faster now because they're not having to go further and further out. And now they can do their part much, much faster. And so the reason that you're, you seem to be getting a much faster result is because each machine is, is no longer having to have such low access to the data. It all fits in the L1 cache or L2 cache or L3 cache or main memory instead of being on disk or something, right? But that's something to keep in mind, right? It's like, okay, you know, maybe if I just use, you know, several machines with, you know, two terabytes of data, you know, memory each, each then, all the data is going to fit in memory, and then things are much faster, just because we're not out here. And so he says, yeah, you should really. You guys said, no, no, don't think of it as, you know, O of one, think of it as, oh, square root of N. Because of the way hardware works. It is O of one if you just restrict yourself to one of these, right, partitions. But 
if we're dealing with Raj Mahatma Dad, you have to realize, no, it's not true, right? And even if you're taking the algorithms course, right, or a theoretical course, they'll even tell you that, right? They'll say at some point, yeah, you know, as as your numbers get bigger, right, addition is no longer all of one operation because you've got so many bytes, right? If you get if your numbers are 50 bytes long, right, it's, it can take longer to do that addition than they're just, right, 32 or 16 bits or 64 bits. So yeah, so history, right? In 1990, a one gigabyte of RAM cost $100,000. It's hard to believe, right? Um, actually, I once talked to a guy who said, they bought like a megabyte of RAM for $100,000. Yeah. And uh, what's that? Yeah, it was a long time ago, right? I mean, they did buy this board for the the, the main machine in computer science department. You see, you're running for $100,000, like a, those are megabytes. But 95, Java came out. The price of memory got I mean, in five years, it went down significantly, but still, I mean, 30 Ks. Um, 2000, Java 3 came out. Um, 2001, Scalic has started. Um, 2002, there's a project that started, was called Nutch, it eventually became a dupe. Um, and 2004, Google. Um, released their famous MapReduce paper where they talked about how they were using MapReduce. Um, now they didn't invent MapReduce. Um, Lisp had MapReduce and Lisp was created in the 60s. Um, um, F Sharp um, came out in 2005. By that time, the memory was down to 108, you know. Um, 2006, um, it became Hadoop. Um, 2007, Closure came out. 2009, right? Spark has started, so we're talking seven years. But those seven years, um, functional pr programming is becoming much more common. Um, 2010, right? One gigabyte of RAM cost $12. So when people started thinking about Hadoop in 2002, it was costing like $1,000 for a gigabyte of memory. As far as people were looking at 12, and they could see the historical trends. It's like, well, okay, we're going to take a couple of years to get this project done, and so a couple of years, it's going to cost a dollar, right? So in these days, in AWS, you can, you can get a, a machine with two terabytes of memory. So. Um, and Hadoop came out in 2012. Um, Spark came out two years later. And that's why the big difference is Hadoop is Hadoop is object oriented, pro, is object oriented, oriented so it's, you're subclassing things. Spark is like, no, we're just going to use functional techniques. Now, what does happen? There are different parts of the dupe. And one of them, they had to implement a distributed file system. And the Spark people said, great. I mean, they just solved that problem for us. We'll just use theirs. Um, so when you download Spark, that's why when you download Spark, it says pre-built pre for a dupe something something because you're getting the distributed file system with it. And 2015, it cost four dollars, and I have no idea what it costs today. But I mean, could you buy a laptop with less than a gigabyte of memory? Maybe I think I don't know. So yeah, the Hadoop system it comes with the Drupal file system. And a MapReduce 
um, section, and every problem you solve with Hadoop has to be reduced to doing a map, and then a reduce, and then it can be another map, and another reduce, or map, 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 but it's map and reduce, that's, that's all you get. Um, so yeah, it's faster, um, more functionality, it has more than just map and reduce, and you can even have a repel, you can type in code and see what it does, and test it out. When we look at data science or even big data, um, we always come into this crazy two language problem. You know, Java is pretty fast. It's not as fast as C or Fortran or Rust or Go or a number of other languages, but it's pretty fast. Um, but it's still, you, you write the code and you compile the code and then you find out you compile errors and then you recompile and recompile. And then finally you run it and you, oh, now I've got logic errors and you go back, right? So it's, it's not really fun at times, right? It's just, um, a Python, um, it's interactive, right? I mean, you can execute what line of Python and see what it does. That's why people like it. It's like, oh, it's, it's, it's just direct. I mean, you don't public void static main. No, no, it's just type in the code, execute. No, it doesn't work. Just, you can execute line by line, right? Um, so it's interactive, but it's not very fast, right? Um, and it's it's actually extremely hard to make Python really fast, be the way it's designed, right? Um, R is another language the statisticians use it. Um, it's also very interactive. I mean, kind of R. It's not that it's not as fast as Python. It's it's much slower. It can be really really slow. Um, MATLAB is another one, um, common in the math world, scientific world. Um, it's also expensive. Um, and Scalar comes along, and it, it's basically, um, it compiles the, down, it runs on the JVM, so it's, it's not quite as fast as Java because there's a lower head, um, but there's not much boilerplate, and they also come with a repel, so you can type in a line of code and see what it does, so it's more interactive. Um, then you get this language called Julia, right? And it was it's designed um, to be fast and interactive. Now the problem is, um, you know, Python's everywhere, right? It's very common, um, but it's not fast. And if you're doing data analytics, that can be a problem. And so if you're developing your own algorithms, if you start with Python, what do you have to do? Eventually you're gonna have to rewrite that code in a faster language. Now we're going to use the pandas and right, um, SciPy, and what they do is they've written the algorithm in C, and then Python just calls that C code, right? So when we start using data frames and, and, and doing these calculations on them, what happens is that you're using Python to interface with C code. And so that's fast because it's, you're running C code, not the actual Python, which is fine as long as all you need to do is run existing code, right? Which for many people, that's what they do. But as soon as you have to, you want to modify that algorithm or come up with your own algorithm, now you're back in the slow lane. Well, it depends on who you are. Um, 
you know, if you're a biologist, your job is to do biology, and Python is just one of the tools you use to do part of your job, right? So the biologists are not are not really happy to learn C, for example, or C++ or Fortran or Rust or Go or any of those other languages, or even because that's just one that's just one tool. I mean, they spend half their life out in the field doing something, right, or in the lab doing experiments, and they have to come back, and they don't have time to. And so then they just they develop their own algorithm. They to eat it, right? And so they rely on someone else to actually come in, and and that's what's happened with you know the pandas and numpy and scipy is that you know other people have come in and said, okay, he's a, these are the common physical problems of machine learning, and so we'll just you know call these up in a fast language and wrap them in Python. That's the world we live in. Is like, do we, right? You know, I taught this course once using Scala, um, and if your primary focus is to write code for Spark, it's great. Why? Because Scala is written. Spark is written in Scala, so you, I mean, you have that. It is built for that language, right? So it's easier to write Scala code on Spark. It's faster than doing it in any other language. Um, but it's not very interactive. It's not, it's also scale is a very, it's not verbose, but there's like three ways of doing everything. And that just like makes it more complicated and overwhelming at times. So it's not like computer science where for a long time, it's like, well, you learned Java, you're, you're probably good, right? In the data science world, um, there is no one dominant language. The statisticians are focused on R, um, and all the mathematicians are focused on MATLAB. You know, even computer science, I think, you know, Dr. Liu uses MATLAB, and other people are probably use MATLAB just because they're experimenting to come up with new algorithms, right? And so they want something interactive they do develop fast. Um, and Python is used a lot. Okay, any questions so far? Julia, yeah, it's catching on. Um, it depends upon you know, it's an age old problem with computer science, right? And computing is, or technology, you have something that might be better, but there's something else that's more popular. So, what which wins, right? Um, you know, so the use of Julia is increasing. Um, there's more and more libraries for it. Um, No, so the, the question is, why is Julia both interactive and fast? Um, you know, the, the basic reason is that, you know, Python was developed in the 90s, and we've learned a lot about, you know, compilers. Um, compiler technology has advanced quite a bit. We've learned a lot about performance. Um, and so that's sort of a general answer, right? Doesn't tell you specifically what's going on. Um, one, they, they have not made the same mistakes Python did. For example, in Python, um, you don't, when you, you know, you just say A equals a value, right? And there is no type information Associated with the variable a, um, and so if you, if you want if you do a plus b in Python, oh, what do you have to do? Well, you have to go 
to the memory block that's pointed A, look at the type information there, and look at the type information here, right? And then, oh, now you know what the two types are. Now you can figure out how to do the addition. You know, if you think of what happened when you, when you do that in C, well, in C, the compiler looks at the two types, and the compiler generates machine code explicitly to, to add those two types, right? So by the time C is, by the time Python is on adding the two numbers, C program has forgotten about those numbers completely and is, you know, way, way ahead, right? So Python, so Julia is compiled. Um, and the compiler will generate machine code, right? And they also use the LLVM to help optimize code. So they've got a JIT so they can look at what your code is doing and then optimize the function for that performance. So there's a lot of things they've done to, they also don't use, they don't use classes. Um, because finding methods is it, it slows you down. But you have to go to the class and look at the method, and then you have to worry about the inheritance structure. Um, so it's all functions. They do a number of things. To, and you'd hope that, you know, in 30 years, computer science advanced to be And the surprising thing is it took that long because there was a project in Sun Labs um, with a language called Self. And that came out um, about the same time Java did. And the goal was, um, can we make a dynamic, you know, dynamic language as fast as Fortran? And the answer was yes, here it is. Um, the problem is it was produced in a company that came out with Java and they're like, Sorry, we're going to go with that guy, not this one. Um, so Python, right? It's an interpreted dynamically typed language. It was created by Guido Van Rossum. He was just a programmer, which is not happy with the language he had, and so on. You create one that you like. <laughs>